Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Uh, so I think my task today is to focus on, I'm going to focus very specifically on breast cancer and try and go to the heart of how we got to this place of overdiagnosis so that we can figure our, our way out. And I would say that the problem with breast cancer is uh, it is a very serious disease, and many women die of it. I've been devoted my life to taking care of women with breast cancer, and you know, watching a 35-year-old with two small children have a terrible breast cancer and die of it is a terrible thing. And it isn't that we aren't interested in trying to figure out what we can do to decrease that risk. It's terrible when a 60-year-old dies. What can we do to stop it? And, and I think when we really take a step back, think about the historical context, what we were trying to do, what's happened, and how biology and our understanding of that biology has changed, I think it provides some solutions and some ways forward. So I, I, I hope to stimulate some dialogue about that. So a couple of years ago, uh, we were summoned, uh, a group of us came to the National Cancer Institute to have a little think tank about what we could do about the overall problem of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And we decided that what we really needed to do is get the message out to the public that overdiagnosis occurs and is common. It was never an intentional, uh, and it's more common with screening. And it wasn't that it was intentional, it's just that's been a consequence of screening, so to try and better understand that. Uh, and that we should really be thinking about embracing new terminology to replace the word cancer when, in fact, people don't have a kind of disease that's going to inexorably lead to death, uh, uh, metastatic disease and death. And could we think about changing terminology, creating registries, and importantly, how would we mitigate that, uh, mitigate some of the harms of screening by changing our thresholds for what we diagnose? And in certain conditions, like thyroid, clearly, you know, there's no point in screening something that you don't need to know about early. So really trying to change our understanding of what is that nature, what is the biologic nature of these different cancers. And then finally, really trying to think about how to think about what are the underlying, what's the underlying uh, biology of the development of cancers to help us really think about progression and prevention. So I think the most important thing to start with is to first get more light and less heat. Uh, and not to throw the baby out with bathwater, and not to say that all screening is bad, or not to say, you know, it's not really about bad or good. It's like, where, where did the concept come from? So thinking historically, uh, you know, most women who had breast cancer died of breast cancer in the 40s and 50s. In fact, you know, one of the sine qua non of what made us change radical mastectomies for women was the fact that most women who were diagnosed with breast cancer died of their disease, even in spite of very aggressive surgery. So this was our picture of breast cancer, people dying of disease. And when you looked at the statistics on stage of breast cancer, right, most, what, what's happening, in fact, all cancers, what we noticed was people with late stage disease died and people with early stage disease did so much better. The natural conclusion from that is, well, if we could just get to finding it early, that would make the difference because we're trying to stop this inexorable progression to metastasis and death. And if we could really get this whole, this, 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 this cycle here, we would avoid that stage two and three breast cancer. But what happened was not exactly what people expected. So here, um, here, what you can see is these are the, uh, this is what happened as we started screening, and here's the incidence of cancer. Here is local disease, node negative disease, and node positive disease. And what happened is that most of the increase is in node negative disease. That's what you hope. And so the rise in the diagnosis of node negative disease was seen as a great triumph, which it could have been if we had seen it the same kind of concomitant drop in regional disease. And that we've seen in the US in colon cancer and cervical cancer, but we didn't see it in prostate or in breast cancer screening. And I think if you take a step back, I think it's interesting. This is a complicated slide, but I'm going to try and make a couple of points here. Here's the history of, these are the history of breast cancer. And here we have sort of the rise of our understanding of hormone receptors and how we've focused on that. 
the rise of chemotherapy and targeted therapies at the top. And we start to say, well, you know, here, and even, even the declaration, again, the Halstead radical mastectomy, starting at least to start to treat patients, even Hagenson saying the DCIS was cancer and lobular carcinoma was not, this came because people were presenting with masses and symptomatic disease. This cancer here is a very different disease than a lot of the cancers that we might see here. So what happened is, you know, first we had the first Swedish screening trial. Then over time, we start to see a much more rapid uptake of, of uh, screening. And what's happening now to our incidence of, uh, the incidence of, um, is this working? The incidence of breast cancer. I'll move to this guy. So now we start to see the rise of the incidence of breast cancer. And what starts to happen? Well, now all of a sudden there's starting to be uh, trials around ductal carcinoma in situ and what to do about it because this is new. And then you start to see now the emergence of multi-gene assays to try and differentiate good cancer from bad cancer. And then starting to see trials of different forms of radiation. Could we avoid radiation in patients? Because this disease is different from that disease. And the population, I think it's important to put that into place. When Gil Welch publishes his book on, on uh, starting to think about should we be screened for cancer, this would not have been written at this time. And I think it's important to understand that. It keeps us from fighting about it and really trying to better understand it. And now starting to think about maybe a different way of approaching screening to try and figure out how can we maximize benefit and minimize harm. So I think what we did not appreciate was that there's different kinds of cancer. And these different kinds of cancers behave differently. And you're necessarily going to find more of these kinds of indolent cancers when you screen. And it isn't just so much that every cancer goes from one stage to another. And in fact, these kinds of cancers that rapidly progress, screening's not going to impact these. Here we have to focus our efforts on finding better treatments. And it is not that breast cancer is not a serious disease. I know I've devoted my life to treating these women. We want to stop these women from dying. This is probably the group of people that really do benefit from screening. So how in the world will we get to trying to figure that out? And how do we make sure that we know that these kinds of cancers are common and more commonly surfaced by screening? And how can we make sure that we don't over-treat somebody or that we maybe think about what to call these cancers? So how do we get there? So now we've evolved our understanding of cancer, and we're trying to figure out how we can evolve our approach to screening and prevention because cancer, breast cancer, is not one condition as we thought it was in the 50s. We now know it is many. And that we now have this firmly in our mind that you know, for the cancer that grows very rapidly, right, we're going to have minimal benefit. This is where your maximum benefit would be, and that's where your potential harm would be. So what can be done? So the first thing is to think about better biomarkers of extremely low metastatic potential. And I'll show you uh, some of what we are trying to put forward or trying to test. Then you can recognize that screening increases the chance of detecting these idle cancers or conditions, as David would, Francis would tell me to say. And that in particular, the non-palpable mammographic lesions are more likely to be detected or much higher chance of being idle that allows us to avoid overtreatment if we have some confidence that early treatment isn't going to make a difference. Then we can start thinking about how we can over, over screen by minimizing the detection of these guidal conditions, such as not making low grade DCI as a target of early detection. And we'll talk more about that on Friday. So the better we understand biology, the more we can tailor uh, treatment and screening. Uh, so I'm going to now focus on this effort as we started to flood the market or our population of, of what we know as cancer changed and we had a lot more of these indolent lesions, then there became an important focus on how could we develop molecular tests to tell what's different. And this, in fact, may be uh, something that can be uh, used across populations, even to thyroid cancer, and then redefine what is cancer. Because again, cancer is something we think of as something that will kill you. But if it's really not or it's some kind of in condition, maybe we should think about it as something different. 
So which breast cancers re return? This has really been uh, an important focus of, of diagnostic test development. Now I'm going to focus in particular on the second test, Memoprint, partly because this test was developed on women who were not treated. So if we're trying to understand the natural history, we really want to understand what happens, what, can we define the biology of, of disease that left untreated really will be indolent and really will be left alone. So, uh, and that's how this particular test was set up. And in particular, uh, there were 70, 70, uh, 70 genes. Each row is a, is a gene, uh, each uh, um, I mean, each column actually is a gene. Every row is a patient. This was the original publication in Nature. These are the, uh, the metastatic events. And you can see this cluster of genes here and here. They set a threshold here for low and high. And what's interesting, this is their uh, publication, this is a, a validation publication, and really they were focusing on this five-year risk to try and figure out who needed chemotherapy and who didn't, saying the people at early risk for recurrence uh, would be the people who would benefit most from chemotherapy. So again, there's both risk and what's going to help you diminish that risk. But what's interesting over time with hormone-positive breast cancer is that you tend to get this continued recurrence risk. It's a disease that has a very long natural history. Not triple negative disease, but the hormone positive disease. So trying to think about, here's the five year, but really what about something like at 20 years? Do we have something at 20 years? So what we decided to think about is, is could we actually look at a threshold where we said this would be ultra low or this indolent threshold below which, and in fact, you, that almost looks like the break in the genes is best here, if you could set that threshold before any metastatic disease occurred. And we looked at two cohorts, and this is not from a randomized trial. This is simply from looking at cohorts of women who happened to, where we took advantage of the work that had been done by the, uh, the group from, the, uh, from NKI in the Netherlands, and said, well, look, let's look at the European validation study, and let's look at the roster screening uh, study where the 70 gene was being tested for feasibility. Uh, and these would be, this was 2004, and this was prior to 1990, so an unscreened population and a screened population. A couple of important observations, that is, age of women increase, your, rate, your chance of finding grade one hormone positive and 70 gene low risk tumors increases. Now, if you look in the women under 40, neither group was screened, we don't see any change in the distribution of the fraction of low-risk patients. But we then saw a flip in the good poor-risk tumors in women who were in the screening age. And in fact, of the people who had screen-detected cancers, almost two-thirds were in that lower group. Simply saying that if you screen, you're going to find more disease that has that low risk biology, that's what screening does. And here you can see that actually you go from about 10 to 15 percent up to 30 percent of your cohort of the screen detected cancers being this kind of ultra low risk or indolent threshold. So this is hot off the press, three days old. Uh, this is, uh, we've gone back to a study in Stockholm. Now we should all aspire to have registries like they do in Sweden where they have long-term follow-up. And a lot of these, these were women who were accrued to a trial of tamoxifen versus not, and, uh, and were treated with tamoxifen for two years. If they were alive for two years, they were re-randomized to three more years of tamoxifen versus not. And our question was, could we predict an indolent, uh, an indolent outcome at 20 years? So this is what this looks like. Here is all the patients in the trial, uh, treated and untreated. And if you look, actually, and what's interesting is if you look at the untreated arm versus the treated arm, here you see this is breast cancer-specific mortality, that at 15 years in the untreated group, you start to see this drop off. So it is interesting that this is a disease with a very long natural history. Even late, there's still some, some drop off in death. However, with the majority of women getting two years of tamoxifen, this is a pretty good outcome. So here you have 
almost 20 years where you're not seeing any kind of recurrence, that's a pretty indolent course. And again, it's not perfect, it's not no risk, and that's important, that becomes something that people get frightened of. But the real question is, if your chance of dying is 20 years later, do you have to do something early up front? That's the important thing, and here's the hormone receptor positive arm, you know, again. Um, uh, a really significant uh, uh, impact here. So I, I want to propose thinking a little bit differently that if, if maybe the way to think about IDLE is that maybe what you do or how you think about it is that you don't have to do a lot of aggressive therapy up front. There's a very low risk of recurrence. Your treatment is successful, likely to be successful at the time of, of any kind of recurrence. So we can be more sanguine about offering more minimal therapy up front. Whereas when you have someone with a really aggressive cancer and you're concerned that they're going to come back with metastatic disease, which is not curable, you want to be more aggressive up front. So this may lead to us to thinking about changing terminology, and we'll talk about that on Friday. And I submit that our, the data we have actually fit this paradigm. Radiation therapy, for example, if you had an idle tumor that was picked up, could you simply do lumpectomy alone and two years of tamoxifen, maybe at the beginning and then again 10 years later. Maybe that's all we need to do because radiation therapy does not impact mortality if your overall reduction in five-year local recurrence risk is low. And again, remember as I said, the kinds of diseases we're seeing, there are all these trials now, look at these, look at these low risk. It doesn't matter what you're testing, these are very low rates of local recurrence much lower than we used to see 30 years ago. We used to quote people that untreated, you get a 40% local recurrence risk. And treated, it would be 10%. All of these, treated or not, are under 10%. So I think what's also really interesting is these are studies of radiation versus no radiation. You know, your luminal A patients here, 5% um, risk. We don't need to. We already have. We know this data fits. And in fact, the majority of node negative patients today are classified as low risk. And there was a study that one of the, my colleagues in the Netherlands showed that in the MINDAC trial, which is using mammoprint, if you apply this indolent threshold, 37% of screen-detected tumors in the MINDAC study meet this threshold. So these are probably women that could have lumpectomy, no radiation, a couple of years of hormone therapy. That's not really a terrible thing. And so it's, I think, a really important idea that part of the evolution to personalized breast cancer care is that as we go forward, we've introduced these multi-gene studies. We're trying to focus on trying to figure out how to get novel therapeutics, improve pathologic complete response in these high-risk women. But what about in these personalizing treatment and screening, minimizing the interventions for these idle conditions? I think that's actually really important. So in the future, the context of risk may be key. And we have clearly seen that one size does not fit all. So how do we then change screening? How do we really change the focus of screening? Well, first we want to think about implementing risk-based cancer screening using an adaptive uh, learning engine. And this is an initiative that we are studying in our Athena Breast Health Network across the five University of California campuses. It's our wisdom study, Women Informed to Screen Depending on Measures of Risk, where we're trying to look at risk assessment for BRCA, BRCA, SNPs, density exposures, and comorbidities to try and figure out when to start, stop, and how often to screen. And we are encouraging women to randomize because we know that's the best way to, uh, to learn. However, uh, we want people to participate. And if they feel strongly about one way or the other, we will still take them and include them. And we're going to test annual screening versus personalized to find out whether we can take people's personal risk and can it be just as safe? Can it be less morbid? Is it going to be preferred by women? And will we be able to really think about prevention? After all, if people are at high risk for developing a cancer, the best thing we could do is prevent it. This is a little bit more detail on our uh, risk screening. But I think what's important here is that risk-based screening has the potential to really improve the way we think about tailoring prevention and treatment, because we're going to profile every tumor uh, that comes through this. And if we can identify, do we find more ultra-low risk tumors? in the groups that were, were, that were where we're screening more? Or what if someone really is at risk for either an indolent cancer, a condition or a very low risk for getting cancer? Maybe that's the group of women that we can just stop screening or screen much less. 
that actually would be really important. And in those groups of people, we can then start to tailor our thresholds. Why should we be looking for little bitty calcifications and things? Just get that off the radar. Stop looking for things that don't matter. That would be very important. And giving people some confidence uh, that there's something that we can do. So I think that biology, since we now know that biology does determine the type of progression, and we have to think about the microenvironment, tumor biology, our exposures, the microbiome, hereditary risk, these are all things that we should start to think about. And maybe the context of risk is a key driver. And that can help us think about how to change the way we approach screening. Um, and so I would say in the future, what we want to think about is you know, the whole buzzword of precision medicine. The, I think it's important to make that concept of precision medicine, meaning that that is what's going to lead us to healthcare value. That we have to not just think about healthcare, and certainly Dr. Ahn has shown us that incentives definitely drive people's behavior. So we have to think about trying to create the ability to innovate around healthcare value. But that means you want to, if you want to maximize benefit and minimize side effects, that means you're going to want to do more for some and less for others. So I think we want to focus on tailoring screening and treatment to provide the most value. And we hope that the introduction of trying to use science and the biology of what we know and the underlying risk and risk predilection can really help us do a better job and apply screening to those that might have the best value from it, where we can really be proud of what we've achieved and really try to avoid harm for those who gain, have very little to gain. So with that, I'll stop.